There are plenty of ways to manage a stock portfolio and plenty of advisors to help you do it. Bruce Jacobs and Ken Levy joined forces over 30 years ago, a partnership based on friendship and an enthusiasm for what they call the art and science of investing. The art is understanding human nature and the science quantitative finance. The company is now a $13 billion institutional asset management firm. And I've come to Davos to talk to Bruce Jacobs. Bruce, great to talk to you. Now, we know that managing stock portfolios using quantitative models is standard practice now, but you're going to have to explain to me a bit, what are quantitative methods? Quantitative methods use different uh, statistical techniques and computer and coding uh, to devise methods that are disciplined in their approach uh, that can offer the opportunity of providing value added going forward. Our background stems from the Wharton School, actually, where I was a professor of finance going back to the early 1980s when I met uh, my future partner, Ken Levy, and we had a great fascination with human behavior in the stock market, and we decided to uh, pursue that as a career. Our whole idea, and getting back to your original question, is to use discipline methods and rigorous academic methods to ferret out opportunities in the marketplace. So someone trying to invest can take a passive fund and play, pay a very low fee and have their money rolled up into a large fund in the market, or they can pay a higher premium, a higher fee, and get more attention paid by a fund manager to, the, to what's happening to their savings. Presumably, you would suggest that that would be a better route to take. Well, passive management can make sense if you believe that the markets are totally efficient, which means that prices respond very quickly to information and respond accurately to information. However, we all know that the efficient market hypothesis, as it's called, is just a hypothesis. In fact, there are many opportunities in the marketplace to add value. And so you can go with a passive approach to investing, but you should recognize that you may be leaving money on the table because there's an opportunity with active management to outperform. And that's the goal of our firm, is to provide active management services and outperformance net of fees. Disentangling is a phrase I've heard a lot in your business. Tell me a bit about that. Well, disentangling is uh, a very important concept for us and one that we developed back in the late 1980s. In fact, we wrote an article called Disentangling Equity Return Regularities, New Insights and Investment Opportunities. We were the first to look at a number of different characteristics of stocks to see which ones really matter. For instance, it was apparent back in the late 1980s that there were chinks in the armor of the efficient market hypothesis, that there was an opportunity for outperformance associated with firms that were a smaller size, firms that had lower price to earnings ratios, firms that have positive earnings surprises, but no one had looked at all these different types of factors jointly. That's what we did to discern which ones really matter, to be able to benefit by constructing portfolios that would benefit from several different of these characteristics simultaneously. In fact, our article received a lot of attention back then, which was an assist to developing our entire investment business. Uh, we won an award from the CFA Foundation. Our article was translated into Japanese and Chinese. And our article also was recognized by Harry Markowitz, who is the founder of Modern Portfolio Theory, uh, as seminal work. So how do I know, if I come to see a potential fund manager, how do I know he's got my best interests at heart? That's a very good question. And if you look at performance results alone, that's always insufficient because it's a matter of skill and not luck. So you really need a disciplined investment approach and rigorous academic methods to discern where there are values. And you need to hire managers who recognize that there are always capacity constraints that are present. So you don't want to hold too much of any one security because you become too liquid and you won't be able to trade at low transactions costs. In fact, we measure our success not by our assets under management, but by our performance for our clients. You talk a bit in your literature about selling short, selling stocks short. Explain a bit about that to me. Well, short selling is very important. We all understand buying long. When you buy long, you're looking for winners. When you're selling short, you're looking for stocks that are actually going to decline in price. And you can make money from that decline. And that's the goal. And you can use shorts in different investment strategies. For instance, we offer an absolute return strategy that uses shorts and longs with equal dollar balance. That is, we invest 
the same amount in positions long as we invest in positions short to make money from both winning and losing stocks. And there's in fact another strategy that we introduced to the investment community which is referred to as 130-30. Here you hold $130 long and $30 short. So for every $100 of capital you have, you have a net exposure to the market of $100. And the goal here is to outperform the market. What the short positions permit you to do is to make money from stocks that decline as well, in addition to the long positions you hold to make money from winning stocks. To people outside the market, all that, that phrase, selling short, always implies some kind of predatory activity, taking advantage of misfortunes out there in the corporate world that you can make money on. Is that fair? Well, that's, that's always a potential concern, but that's certainly not true with what we do. Uh, we are not rumor mongers. What we're doing is we're looking for stocks that are overvalued. The goal is to sell them short so that we can benefit from the price decline. And by selling them short and there's a price decline, then the new price will represent their worth. And companies should sell for their worth and not be overvalued. So we're looking to make money from overvalued stocks. Thought leadership is a phrase that's used a lot, particularly here in Davos. I mean, how important is that phrase to you folks at Jacobs Levy? Does that resonate with you? Thought leadership resonates very much with us. Uh, we've done a lot of thought leadership and introduced a lot of new ideas and concepts to the investment community. In fact, we have a book called Equity Management, The Art and Science of Modern Quantitative Investing. And in this book, we talk about many concepts that we've introduced to the investment community, which have been put in practice today. Beyond that, I've written two books, Capital Ideas of Market Realities and Too Smart for Your Own Good. Both of these books consider what we call free lunch strategies. Free lunch strategies are strategies that offer very high return, yet at very low risk. As a result, there's a grand interest in these sorts of strategies as quite an allure, and investors put a lot of money into these strategies, in which case the strategies become crowded. And as a result of becoming crowded, it can lead to market bubbles. And when everyone needs to exit at the same time, it can lead to market crashes. And we saw this in 1987 with the crash on October 19th. We saw this again with the global financial crisis in 2008. ESG principles are something we talk about a lot as well these days. And a lot of companies sign up and get involved in those kind of principles. Where do you stand with the ESG principles from the United Nations? ESG principles are very important to us, environmental, social, and government principles, and we are signatories to the UNPRI, which is the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment. Our goal is to consider ESG factors to see if there's an opportunity to improve return or to reduce risk. Beyond that, clients may request that we restrict certain companies from investment consideration, and also companies can instruct us to use ESG principles in voting proxies on their behalf. Final thought then, Bruce. The model, say, for your retirement has been one that we've all lived by in the 20th century. The markets and the future economy seem to be more hazardous to young people today. Is that still a way of providing for your retirement? Just start investing in the market and hope it works out? You know, indeed, the long-run premiums for the market have been substantial because when you invest in the market, you're participating in the growth of economies. And so, but you need to have a long patience function, clearly, because the markets can be volatile and there have been crashes in the markets, et cetera. So if you're going to invest in the markets and you have the long horizon, you can benefit from that premium that the markets have provided in the last century and beyond. Going forward, though, what's the future looking like? Well, going forward now, individuals are more responsible for their own retirement savings. Previously, it was defined benefit plans, which would provide a guaranteed level of benefits. But now, with defined contribution plans, individuals are responsible on their own. And so they need to make sure they save enough for retirement and that they invest the assets appropriately. No one should invest all their assets in stocks. Of course, you can have a balance between stocks, bonds, real estate, global investing, et cetera, et cetera, in order to achieve some balance in the return that one can achieve. Bruce, pleasure talking to you. Thanks very much indeed. My pleasure. Thank you very much.